Okay. Well, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> wow, there we are. That's a lively crowd. Yeah, we got... <laughs> I'm Sean O'Keefe, and I'm here, uh, and it's a great privilege to be here to represent John Hamry, uh, who was called to Capitol Hill to testify. So I got the best end of the bargain. I can assure you of that. I think uh, <laughs> Joel Cartwright would agree as well. Those uh, days are uh, certainly in the rearview mirror. We're particularly appreciative to AT&T for their sponsorship here of today's uh, proceedings. And I want to acknowledge Chris Smith for his uh, great contributions to making all this work. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Bert. Uh, Internet of Things is penetrating an ever wide swath of daily life and the global economy. Our good friends and uh, helpful proliferators of information at Wikipedia define the Internet of Things as the network of physical objects, things embedded with electronics, software, sensors, network connectivity, which enables these objects to collect and exchange data. Essentially, it allows objects to be sensed and controlled remotely creating an integration between physical world and computer systems. Think smart grid, energy systems related to each other to maximize efficiency, and all tied to that objective. Internet of Things is transforming modern business, leveraging embedded sensors, connectivity, digital analytics, and the automation to deliver greater efficiency and effectiveness on a wide range of market fronts. The military has been a leader in developing many of the Internet of Things component technologies, but can do more to leverage the benefits of Internet of Things solutions. The broader national security establishment also faces unique challenges in adopting Internet of Things technologies ranging from security and mission assurance to infrastructure and cost constraints and cultural hurdles. Now, in September, just a couple of months ago, the CSIS Strategic Technologies Program released a report leveraging the Internet of Things for a more efficient and effective military, which outlines how the military can adopt lessons from the private sector to take advantage of the broader benefits of Internet of Things. There are a series of recommendations from near-term applications of existing technologies to investment the military can make today to enable Internet of Things adoption in the future. Now, before turning to the report and a panel of experts, which will walk through a variety of different uh, aspects of the report that uh, Will Carter will moderate, we've asked an exemplar of thinking through these kinds of strategies to join us this morning to spend a little time elaborating on how this can have great application to the national security establishment in particular. General James Cartwright is a naval aviator, veteran of extraordinary proportion in terms of his operational capabilities in that area, and a distinguished career in the United States Marine Corps wide variety of operational and systems management roles that he occupied during the course of that illustrious career that uh, culminated as the first Marine to ever serve as the commander of the United States Strategic Command. And immediately thereafter, uh, his final assignment in uniform was as a, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He now joins us here at the Center for Strategic in international studies in the capacity as a senior advisor and really an exemplar on a wide range of issues just like we're going to hear today. Please welcome General James Cartwright. Uh, fill in back there. Uh, you, know, you may not want to stand for the whole period here. Um, a couple of uh, opening notes here. I mean, first and foremost, I was a Marine. It's the 10th of November. Happy birthday, Marines. <laughs> Couldn't survive if I didn't do that. Um, 
unfortunately, both Sean and I have had a, a lot of uh, assignments where we worked together, while, particularly while he was at NASA and, and uh, other assignments. And, uh, and through all of that period, you know, you, you look at these activities. I was an aviator, but the only way I see the airplanes I flew is to look at them on poles in front of, of bases and things like that. That was a long time ago. Uh, love to go back to that time, but <laughs> you are where you are. Um, I think it's important here uh, to put this effort in context and to try to move and translate it to some extent into the military parlance and, and thought process that, um, that we're trying to generate here and where it fits in, in all of the activities going on. And much of the dialogue today is about uh, offset strategies as you look at them and what is an offset strategy and why do you have an offset strategy. Historically, offset strategies were a response where incremental improvement was no longer sufficient to keep ahead of the threats that we were, we were tasked to address. And usually those threats and the need for an incremental strategy was driven either, you know, either by the measures of scale of, of cost, of geographic location or depth or reach, or domain activities, in other words, being able to do something underwater, on the sea, in space, et cetera. But they were to go in areas and make fundamental changes that would disrupt the status quo, move you in a direction quickly to gain competitive advantage and move forward. Today's offset strategy, the department is calling it the third offset strategy. People will argue about that. Uh, it doesn't really matter. The, the important thing is the necessity for this strategy is to start to get at issues of scale. In other words, we are not able to be every place we need to be when we need to be there with the forces we need to be there. The movement, et cetera, and the number have driven us to you know, the, the famous admiral saying of, at, at some point here, if I keep going on a straight line, I'll have one ship on each coast. You know, how do you start to, to address that issue? What do you do? The most recent offset strategies had to do with precision, um, precision in weapons, precision in logistics, et cetera, but, but being able to bring that, that type of capability to the forefront. Uh, most recently, Secretary Work out at the Reagan Center here um, really kind of outlined in his mind what the essence and the key leverages were in the current offset strategy. And those lessons and that activity had to do with man-machine partnering. That was first on the list. That's not a thing. That is a cultural, organizational issue, far more difficult than things, quite frankly, at the end of the day, to get instrumented and into the thing. And those were going to be enabled by things like automation, learning machines, robotics. Those were the core elements in the discussion about this offset strategy to enable. Okay? What is it we're going to enable? That's, that's the question. And we have been working for probably um, a good 15 years at what we have called net-centric command and control, net-centric operations, net-centric strategies to take advantage of networking our capabilities. Okay? And as you do that, the next element in that activity is to start to bring that into command and control. So while we have networks out there today and we act and, and react to those networks and what they sense and what they tell us and how we react to it, most of that activity is really networking people. The next evolution in this is to bring the things into it, so to speak. And in order to do that, there's been two major efforts that are going out there, going on out there. One in the technology side, one in the, the theory side, so to speak, of command and control. The net, on the thing side of it, it is the self-aware learning machine. The ability to have that capability um, in, an, in, an, in an entity and to be able to put it out there in the network and have it do what it has been, what objectives have been set mostly by man, okay? That, that's been key in bringing us to this step. But the second part, which gets no, none of the notoriety, quite frankly, but has gone on heavily in the universities, in the think tanks, and in the um, 
uh, military schools, uh, probably the essence of much of the writing that has occurred is this integration of two types of decision theory. One of them is called gaming theory. It's been around for a while. Gaming theory is basically, the, at its essence, the ability to understand the interactions between two competitive activities that are controlling things out there, and they're competing against the same objective with each other, and both of them are intelligent. That's, that's the essence of game theory. And the other theory is swarm theory, which is now basically replacing and starting to replace what used to be called maneuver. Okay, we started with mass, we went to maneuver, now we're into swarm theory. And es essentially what the schools are de um, defining that is decentralized, self-organized systems capable of executing all or part of an objective. Okay, swarm theory. Now, you know, you get you get lost in all of this theory and you say, what the heck does that mean? Why don't we just call it command and control? Well, how you command these things, how you think about where man fits in the loop, how you think about what you can devolve and partner with machines to do, and how you start to move, in essence, in the simple form of how many men it takes to run a machine to how many machines a man can control. Okay, that's the transition. In the precision game, when we talked about airplanes, we talked about how many passes per target in order to kill the target, and then with precision, how many targets per pass. It's the same here. How many machines per man can you actually start to integrate into your objective to get to scale, to get to cost equations and cost points that can actually do what we need to do. And the integration of these two theories is the next evolution of net-centric warfare, net-centric command and control, swarm theory and gaming theory, and, and their intersection and how we do that. Whether you're trying to con control a, a fleet of vehicles, a fleet of airplanes, a group of people, all of these things are going to have to integrate under this in order to get to this next level of command and control, which is, in, in essence, what the third offset strategy is trying to accomplish. When you look at the Internet of Things, where does this fit? How do you do it? The word partnering here with learning machines, the word partnering is probably the most important cultural word in this activity. <laughs> Making transitions like this is like I often say, going through mourning, okay? First, there's denial, okay? Second, there you compete with the activity. And in its most mature stages, you finally learn to partner with it, okay? So go back to big blue and chess, you know, man competing against the, the learning machine. Jeopardy and Watson, again, man competing with a learning machine. And now what the objective that Secretary Work and the department have put out is, it's time to move the department to that mature stage of partnering with these machines. And the only way that you can do that, and the only facilitating activity that, that is missing, and which this study points out is, where is the common language that allows us to partner with all of these self-aware, self-learning entities out there, whether they be the light bulb in your house, you know, or, you know, an, an F-35 someplace, at, you know, on the other side of the earth. What is the common language that, for command and control in net-centric warfare, that binds them together? Okay. Now, the challenge for the department, quite frankly, will be who controls that language. And how is it set? Do we go by service lines so we organize by domain? Do we go by mission lines so that we organize for various activities? Yet to be determined. The, the space of competitive activity within the department. You know, who will control this? Um, it's going to be critical, and it's probably going to be some of both. Okay? But that competitive space is essential in understanding and then realizing this objective that the department has set to move into this third offset strategy. And so it's very little about a thing. It is not a technical invention awaiting to be determined. 
It is the organizational construct around which the department has decided to organize itself and move forward. And that common language probably is relatively simple to put forward, but it will have to be able to get through the normal activities that uh, the department, in, in essence, how do I set an objective? How do I find that objective? How do I fix on that objective? How do I have effect on that objective and then assess it? And that network has to be able to run through all of those pieces, whether it is just to do maintenance or whether it is to destroy something, it doesn't matter. And whether it is to be done by a physical entity or a virtual entity, doesn't really matter. Okay? But the ability to move from the number of men per machine to the number of machines per man is the ultimate objective here in a command and control construct that allows that to occur. Um, you can see elements of it out there today in a lot of the reporting and a lot of the press. What the study has done is to start to highlight those areas where we have made some progress, but also where challenges remain. Um, and at the end of the day, again, this is not an invention that's required. It, I don't want to call it purely a leadership issue, but it is an organizational issue around which the department has to look at it. And like any other, it's disruptive. It's highly disruptive. It's difficult. I mean, all my years as a pilot saying maybe I should be, you know, someplace in the desert and maybe I should be controlling 20 airplanes someplace on the face of the earth and it doesn't really matter to me where, to to get to that cultural position is like giving up the steering wheel in your car. You know, how incrementally do you want to sneak up on it? What's the imperative about speed of moving forward? What are the control factors that are going to go on? Who controls what's going on here? How do we do that? All of these are the questions that net-centric activities beg for us today. And we cannot move forward without understanding the internet of things and the concepts and the controlling factors that physically make that possible, the engineering that's necessary, and how we're going to implement that into this large national security arena. And so that sets the conditions, I hope, uh, for the discussion that we will have with the panel and, and about the study, about the findings of the study, about the good work that, that was done in the study. Thank you so much. the standards on the military side for being able to be partners in their environment. Because if you, if you look at the technology, somebody dies if we don't get it right on the one side and maybe my temperature's a little too hot in the other. Like, is there some sense of where that threshold lives? Uh, I'm going to go back up here and get to the, to the mic. Um, you know, the, the thought process is there isn't one answer for that. Um, there will be activities that will be highly leverageable um, and the protection activities associated with the resilience of the system, the ability to, to recover, et cetera, will be dependent on the task and the risks associated with the task. At the high end, uh, the department sets some very rigorous standards about the resilience of a network and its capability, whether it be for, um, for flight type reasons or for um, weapons, say, of mass destruction, et cetera. And then there are other activities, more on, say, the lo logistics or administrative side, that will not require it and will be very um, open to pulling in. And so the department will have to set that, that goal. The hope is that when they do that, the barrier to entry will be lowered, not raised. So, you know, this is a lot to do with uh, much of what's going on in acquisition reform. Can we get the large capital platforms for which 
you know, it, uh, you want to, I mean, I've got 40 years of acquisition reform, how to make it go faster. And the reality is it's like ordering a soldier to sleep faster. You, you can't do it. I mean, you really can't. So how do we start to separate mission systems, platforms? How do we start to separate risk profiles so that they're logical and we can reduce the barriers to entry on those. And that's, that's a lot of the challenge that the department is trying to take on, is in, in my perspective, sitting on the outside looking in. Sir. Uh, so you discussed uh, you know, the need for the Internet of Things concept and moving that through the Pentagon. Can you talk about some of the risks of doing that, particularly in the cyber arena? Obviously, as a former commander of STRATCOM, you dealt with that. Uh, yeah, I had a couple of experiences with cyber. Um, you know, it's a you know this is a conversation that's that is about risk, and if you're going to do gaming theory, the assumption is the risk is equally assumed on both sides of the equation. So, you know, if I invent ball ammunition and put it in my M today M16, and somebody else has an AK-47, because I have an M16, I'm not going to throw it away because they have an M. You're always going to have competitive activity. The question is, how do you raise the barrier, the cost to entry here for your adversary? How do you impose cost on them to stay with you? And how do you compete and maintain competitive leverage on your adversary? And the reason you go into an offset strategy is because you're losing that. That's why we're doing what we're doing. And by doing this, yes, we're going to go into a risk area. There is no such thing as competitive activity without risk on the other side. But the idea here is we believe, certainly, um, in this nation that our technology capabilities, the ability to integrate technologies, will give us the leverage. And we're going to go after that and find that in the areas where we have synergy with the commercial sector, where what they're doing actually helps us and vice versa. And so we're going to go in there with an understanding of risk. Now, the, the previous question was how do we manage that risk? And it's not a one-size-fits-all. So the risk that I assume by doing one thing is, you know, may be substantially less than, than something else. It's understanding that risk. It's understanding the access vectors that come from that risk and then managing them to the maximum extent practicable and affordable. Sir. Uh, sorry, Last week there was a report from uh, ProPublica saying uh, that it takes the military sometimes six months to patch vulnerabilities in uh, smartphones and leaving you know, classified information vulnerable for months uh, without people doing anything. Do you think it's time uh, to revamp and, and overhaul the way the military approaches uh, smartphones? Um, let's just go to smart electronics, smart machines, learning machines, etc. The question is now, what is an appropriate way and what are the recovery factors that you want to have? If I built the Humvee, okay, I built it with an understanding that it is not perfect, but that it could take a certain amount of damage and that I could repair that damage in the field in a certain amount of time with a certain number of people. We need to put that kind of thought process, and we have, to the machines that we're talking about here that are connected, but we also need to look at what's the resilience factors and how do I get resilience? Is it just by patching? Are there other ways to approach resilience? And there are. There are other technologies, et cetera. And so the question is, again, with the risk factors associated, how robust do we want to make these systems? Okay. And you're right. Culturally, I mean, this is just not an area where we've worked resilience probably to the level that we need to to be competitive on the battlefield. So coming with net-centric warfare, you're going to have to think about the next generation of how I get resilience in these systems on the battlefield. And that's being taken on very robustly. Uh, Lloyd Hand, King and Spalding. Um, uh, General, um, do you foresee that the department will establish an office somewhat like Andy Marshall's in the past to permeate this concept of Internet of Things uh, throughout uh, the military. And a kind of a part B is, how do you foresee the ability to overcome what traditionally has been this bifurcation between um, warfare of the future and acquisition of the past? Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of what we have just discussed goes at this issue. and. And probably at least uh, uh, 
the point, the parts of the acquisition reform that that I've been participating in um, with the uh, congressional committees, et cetera, has been to try to understand the machine side of this equation versus the Moore's Law side of this equation, the, t the, the agility necessary on the battlefield versus the agility to innovate and, and create. And how do you do that at the platform level? How do you do that at the entity level? And clearly the direction that both the, the legislature is moving and the uh, Department of Defense is that the greater agility lives over there on the software network side of the equation. And so competitive advantage in the increments in a conflict is most likely going to be driven at that area, and that's where they're focusing. Platform is a 15 to 20 year activity. If you want to modify it, it's probably a three to five year activity. And so getting an entire fleet configured, et cetera. And so the, the agility that the department is trying to uh, reinforce in this offset strategy is more on the mission system side and on their ability to adapt quickly in the software firmware side of the equation. Is that always true and universally true? No, but to a large extent for the systems that are being built, it is where the leverage is, and so it's where the focus is going to be. On the Andy Marshall side of looking out at the future, being an advocate for this kind of activity, creating the future imperatives and understanding what the likelihood is, both Andy Marshall and the National Intelligence Center, the NIC, um, tend to look at those. Uh, Andy Marshall is one of those <laughs> once-in-a-lifetime guys. Um, finding the, the replacement you know, is going to be tough because that was more about a person who could carry the gravitas to do that. Um, the question here is, can a group or a party or an office do that? Going to be tougher. Um, nah, that's a personal opinion. I mean, uh, but you do have to have an advocate and you do have to have somebody that kind of sees around the corners out there and says, this is where we've got to go. If we don't get here, um, these are the kinds of risks we're going to assume in a world that's got to move in this direction. Uh, demographically or whatever. Sir. Peter Pennington. Uh, I'm interested in the cultural issue that you're raising. Uh, a senior Marine officer has sat at the front of uh, this room and pointed out that the Marines have always been short of money and have to make he do. And how much he enjoyed his young officers getting hold of a weapon system, and then doing things with it that nobody ever thought of. I would like to suggest that there's a whole generation in uniform now who think of the internet in a total different way, possibly because their frontal lobes have been adjusted, but they think of the internet in a totally different way than any of us BOFs. Uh, I mean, you're, you're right. Uh, and, and that will assist us in generational change. Um, the question is how do we move the rest of the force along, et cetera, put the pieces in place to make room for and, and bring on. Uh, my story on this is uh, my time, uh, I initially was uh, part of the program office for the F-18 when we built the F-18, and we put it out there and you know, the services have a way of introducing new aircraft. You take your best pilots, most seasoned, you put them in the new airplane, they look at it, they assess it, and they say, yeah, it's going to do everything you want. We had to turn off so much of the F-18 to allow those guys to feel comfortable. I mean, we had, we had things like, there is no way you can do trend analysis watching digits go up and down. You must have a needle. So we had to go in and draw needles. And it wasn't until we got what we called the Hornet Babies that the real potential of the aircraft was recognized, okay? But, you know, you're gonna go through this, uh, it, and you can't just stop and say, okay, all the young guys, you're in charge. Now, they'd like that, but it just won't happen culturally. Um, the question is, on the speed of that, in, is, is the imperative that comes with it, and the value and the benefit. When people can see, this will do what I need to do, and it will do better, far better than what I am doing right now. A, B, there's a role for me when I do this, et cetera. Those are the key things that allow you to move this through. And the department takes these issues on historically in between wars, so to speak. And the imperative to make change in that period is the challenge that you're addressing. It's really difficult. 
because people don't want to change. They, you know, they just went through and they survived by doing program A, and now you're asking them to discard A and go to B. It's tough. It's tough, and that's why the office is so important. The function that Andy Marshall has created and done for us for so long it, is it creates that vision of an imperative that we must be ready to respond to, and we cannot wait for it to emerge. We have to go now. Sir. General, uh, Terry White with at and One question for you. Um, Thomas Edison talks a lot about uh, the, the path to success is fraught with failure. Can you talk about what, is, what are the factors that will lead the Department of Defense to be willing to invest in failure to get to these successes? And to get to a disruptive technology, it really takes that kind of investment. Yeah. Um, probably the good news story on, on this activity is that, um, and we're, we're seeing it you know, you can kind of watch this in real time watching what we're doing with automobiles. But you can sneak up on it and the culture, or you can just go. But, but the opportunity to do this in a virtual environment and to work out so many more of the bugs, flaws, challenges, um, interface issues uh, are, are, are really powerful. Um, for the department, this is absolutely essential, um, mostly and mainly because, number one, the norm in the Department of Defense is a high school education and two years of vocational training. Interfaces with machines have to be able to bridge that. Okay, that's absolutely essential. If we don't, if we demand that the pilot have the equivalent of two master's degrees, aeronautics and, and IT, in order to fly an airplane, the cost per machine is us off the page, okay? And that's part of what we're struggling with. So we've got to get these interfaces right, the interfaces between man and machine, whether it is Siri and talking, whether it is actual connection to the brain, whether, you know, I mean, you know, all of these things are the work of DARPA, quite frankly, on the edge. Um, but these man-machine interfaces and then the ability to wring them out in a virtual environment are, are where we hope the leverage exists to be able to get at the issue, which is so critical that you bring up. I mean, it's just absolutely essential to be able to do. One more. Sir Nate Hughes, uh, Second Front Systems, thank you for your service and happy birthday. Um, following up a little bit on the culture question, but blowing it out a little bit, you've talked about the importance of software for agility, for, you were just talking about user interface, user experience. So much of that is happening outside the defense industrial base. Um, so much money is going into cybersecurity and advanced analytics from Wall Street um, that this isn't necessarily, a lot of this innovation is disconnected from the national security mission and a lot of it is, there's also a cultural divide that emerged in the last couple of years. So could you talk a little bit about maybe bridging that divide out to Silicon Valley and other innovation hubs? The, the sort of narrative of the, the split between this world of the NSA and the world of Facebook and Google and Apple where so much talent is, uh, is sort of attracted these days. Yeah. Um, you know, we're making a lot of that. And you know, part of it is the cultural getting over of, you know, I don't want to say this the wrong way, but, um, you know, should I go to Ford, Chrysler, GM to look for next generation technology or am I going to Silicon Valley, et cetera? It is part of this is trying to understand the value of two very different engineering schools of thought here. Um, the, the manufacturing of, of capital assets, um, so to speak, and the software side of it, and what has allowed gaming theory and, and um, swarm to intersect is really over there on that, that, that software side, okay? And that right now is where the leverage is. Give it some amount of time and the balancing will, will start to reoccur. But right now, there is so much leverage, upside potential over here on the software side of the house that not understanding what they do, and you can't throw two of these guys in the same room. I mean, it, it, you know, they, have, they have trouble yet integrating, okay? And part of what the challenge for the department is, is how do I integrate these two areas and, and leverage both of them? And right now, it's clearly over here on the software side of it. Yet this nation was organized, the incentive structures in our governance, et cetera, were all along the manufacturing side of the house, of, of things. And so the question here is, how do we get 
in with the disruptive side of this equation, take the maximum leverage and upside potential we can, apply it with our best um, work on the manufacturing side, and then bring them together in a way that makes most sense and gives us the greatest leverage. And that's, that's what not only the department's looking for, that's what most of industry, quite frankly, is looking for um, as, as you go forward. And you can see this playing out in the automotive side of the equation. You know, is it going to be an Apple car? Is it going to be, you know, what, what is it? Where do these two come together and, and how do you start to think about them? And I don't, I don't know that we understand that yet. But not talking to it, not aggressively going out and trying to pursue and understand it and recruit to it, et cetera, um, would leave us hugely disadvantaged. And so I think, you know, this is what, this is the, the essence of, of the um, opportunities that we're seeing in the third offset strategy. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. This is a great effort. And, and uh, hopefully here in the next panel, you'll get more into the actual effort itself. Thank you.